From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Canada's borders remain mostly closed, with plenty of restrictions on who can and can't visit. But that didn't stop Canada from issuing hundreds of thousands of work permits just last year. That data is being tracked in a project on immigration by Canadian academics. Immigration numbers across the board plummeted in 2020, which includes a huge spectrum of people, including permanent residents, asylum seekers, and international students. But temporary foreign workers and migrant workers continue to be granted the highest number of work permits. On This Matters, we're talking to Nicholas Cohn, the Toronto Star's reporter on immigration and refugee issues. We'll look into the numbers and what it says about Canada's priorities on immigration, especially in a pandemic. Nick, thanks for making the time to talk again. Hi, Adrian. Thanks for having me on your show again. Before we dive into the data, I wanted to give people a bit of background about work permits in Canada, especially for folks who may not have gone through that process before. How do they work and what are immigration officials looking for? Generally, you know, for anyone who would like to work in Canada, they need to apply for a work permit. It usually starts with a job offer, like, you know, for farm workers, or, you know, if an employer is looking for an IT worker, they will have to start, you know, to do a labor market impact assessment to make sure their presence in Canada is not going to steal a job from a Canadian. And there's an assessment process. And that's how, you know, the visa process works. Right. So let's talk about this data, which comes to us from an academic project that tracks immigration information. They look through who was granted access in 2020, especially compared to 2019. And there's essentially been a massive drop off in travel and immigration around the world in the past year, of course, because of the pandemic. What did the numbers tell us about who was allowed into Canada this past year? And I think it sort of, you know, came as a surprise for me as well, despite all the COVID-19 travel restrictions in place and reduced immigration operational capacity, that the temporary foreign worker programs, by and large, have fared quite well. Canada still managed to issue work permits to almost 323,000 temporary foreign workers, and it just came down by about 10% from the previous year. That may sound like a huge draw, but to put it into context, when you compare that to the 45%, 46% drop in the number of permanent residents admitted to Canada, that's really nothing. So across the board, there was, of course, a drop off in terms of who was granted these applications. But in comparison, you're saying temporary foreign workers were the least affected. Yes, correct. The temporary foreign workers programs the criteria really hasn't changed that much during the pandemic and it's running, you know, pretty much as usual. So even though we have had all these travel restrictions, the valid work permit holders are still exempted. Of course, they still need to follow all the self-isolation and quarantine regulations. But when you look at the permanent residence streams and the other streams, you know, some of them actually are not granted those exemptions. I was looking at some of those numbers and it showed, of course, temporary foreign workers, again, was relatively not affected by some of the restriction migrant workers, too. Many people were allowed in through that category. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the number of admissions actually fell across the board big time among the permanent resident streams. Those who came under the economic class dropped by 45.7%. Family reunifications, like for spouses, parents, grandparents, that dropped by 46%. And even refugees, admissions, you know, it dropped by 49% as well. And when we talk about the temporary residents, the number of foreign workers dropped, you know, just slightly at 10%. But a major group of temporary residents, the international students, it fell by one third to just 280,000 from more than 415,000 the year before. And don't forget about citizenship. Only 108,000 immigrants were granted citizenship in 2020, down by 56.8% from almost a quarter of a million the year before, as our officials, immigration officials, struggled to transition to offer virtual citizenship tests and oath taking ceremonies online. 
Right. So the actual process too is handicapped by what's going on right now, how many people can be working, and the tests themselves even. Thousands of permanent residents got a bit more clarity as Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada says it's starting a pilot to move those tests online. So when we zoom out though, what does it say about Canada's immigration policies or priorities in this moment when we see that temporary foreign workers and migrant workers are the applications that have been the least affected in the pandemic. Right. As some people may know, Canada actually has quite a number of foreign workers programs. And most people would have heard about migrant farm workers from Mexico, the Caribbean and Latin America, as well as foreign caregivers. But there are actually, you know, other less known programs for Canadian employers to bring in temporary foreign workers. You know, I'm sure a lot of us follow the NHL and the NBA. Those athletes also come as temporary foreign workers. There are also film crews in the entertainment industry, scholars and researchers at universities, and even, you know, pastors and priests, you know, religious workers who come through as temporary foreign workers. So the point is, you know, there are just, you know, different ways for Canadian employers to bring in temporary foreign workers. And obviously, based on the numbers and breakdowns of the immigration data that we are seeing, I think Canada's short-term economic interests during the pandemic on top of the government's mind, even though there are travel restrictions and public health concerns, believe it or not, Canada still has skills and labor shortages. We still need, you know, for example, agricultural workers to ensure our food supply chain is not disrupted. We still need or would like to have as many international students to come and study here because they pay three, four times more intuition fees than Canadian students. And just in 2019 alone, they contributed $21 billion in tuitions and also spendings into our economy. And they supported, you know, so many jobs in the education sector. These groups, you know, already have jobs lined up in Canada, right? And especially for the temporary foreign workers and some of the international students who have already, you know, built their own professional networks here. So at least in the short term anyway, they are less of a liability to Canada than trying to bring in permanent residents who would likely face a very punishing job market during the pandemic, you know, with so many job losses and high unemployment rates right now. We'll be right back. And of course, there are some ethical questions about that too. Should you be bringing in people when there's an uncertain job market? You can't necessarily guarantee people who are settling here the same kinds of economic growth that pre-pandemic that existed. Absolutely. Yeah. The researchers, the academic researchers who were gathering this data, they said that these numbers tell a story about Canadian interests. What do they mean by that? And what they refer to Canadian interest, I think is primarily, you know, they're referring to Canadian economic interests, economic interests, which would include people, migrants who have special expertise, knowledge that we desperately need during the pandemic. And at the same time, you know, those interests could also include other aspects like, you know, for the sake and value of entertainment, right? You know, like the sport games and stuff like that. And pretty much, you know, who is being let in. I feel like the officials actually, you know, use the economic lens as a criteria to decide who can come in and who cannot. And again, I think that could be very discretionary in a way, you know, it's not like it's written in stone, you know, who is going to be contributing, but certainly that's through that lens that they are, you know, assessing and use as a criteria to decide who will let in and who we won't. I wanted to revisit that point that you brought up earlier about permanent residency or the applications. You know, PR applications are often seen as a pipeline to eventual Canadian citizenship. Again, what do those numbers tell us about how many applications are happening? And what does that mean, perhaps a bit more long term for Canada? Yeah, 
All those numbers in general, they don't bode well in terms of permanent residencies. For example, you know, the numbers under the economic class, family reunification and refugees, humanitarian protection, they all went down by almost half. But that said, what I found interesting is Ottawa has still managed to maintain the same balance among all those three permanent residence streams as it had in the past. You know, usually about 60% of the total numbers would come as economic immigrants and 30% under the family class and 10% as refugees and under humanitarian streams. And I think that the takeaway of that is that the door was still open for people in need, like, you know, the refugees and asylum seekers, even though, you know, generally overall, the door to Canada was much narrower due to all those restrictions and limitations during these crazy times. And perhaps the timing just isn't really good for many people who may be considering moving to Canada. I mean, yeah, again, moving thousands thousands of kilometers, immigrating to a new country, navigating all of that in a pandemic, not exactly the best timing to be doing that. Yes. And I think it's partially the policies in place, you know, around the pandemic and also the government priorities given to some groups over the others. And don't forget, the pandemic doesn't only affect Canada as an immigrant receiving country. It's also a global pandemic that's affecting every single country in the world. Overseas visa offices are closed trying to get a police certificate or health clearances to travel in lockdowns can be a huge headache. Flights were cancelled. And I think there's also this notion among prospective immigrants that this is not the right time to travel and move to another country. And we see that, you know, the applications for permanent residence and even study permits have dropped significantly. And, you know, many potential international students decide to, for example, put their education plan on hold and are reluctant to pay thousands and thousands of dollars in tuition for online classes in the middle of the night in their home countries. So if Canadians consider this a very volatile, crazy and uncertain time, think about it from a migrant's perspective, trying to uproot your life and start a new life from scratch in the middle of a global pandemic. When we take all of this data and we consider all of it from 2020, do you think it's an anomaly or is it a sign of the times we're living through? Or do you think something more fundamental has shifted in Canada's immigration policy or priorities? I think 2020 was definitely a year of anomaly that no one just saw this coming. But in terms of how far reaching, you know, some of these changes, we are seeing how that would change in the long term. I think for the moment, at least, you know, everyone is thinking, at least the experts I've interviewed are thinking that, you know, once, you know, everyone gets vaccinated, not just, you know, in Canada, but globally, you know, once everyone gets vaccinated, then things will be normal again. And I think, you know, that's still at this moment, the hope of everyone, I'm sure, especially for our immigration minister, Marco Mendicino, who actually would like to bring in 1.2 million immigrants, permanent residents in the next three years to Canada. So I think, again, the hope is, you know, once the whole world gets vaccinated and borders are reopened, then our immigration system, all the disruptions would disappear and life would be back to normal. And let's hope. Yeah, let's hope. Nick, thank you again for your reporting and for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And that is Nicholas Kung, Toronto Star's reporter on immigration and refugee issues. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Let's talk soon.